You're listening to Nostalgia Club, the podcast where we look back on our favorite childhood stories and revisit them as adults. At least one of us hasn't read or watched these series, so we also get a first-timer's opinion. Spoiler alert, we will be discussing storylines and future events beyond the first books and episodes, so proceed with caution. Hello and welcome back to Nostalgia Club, a podcast where we talk about media from our youth that makes us nostalgic. Wow. 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 I'm Gino and I'm joined by... Oh, I hit the mic. Do it again. It's okay. <laughs> I was drinking coffee. Uh, Michael. And Victoria. Woo. And Woo. I'm Gino and we're joined by... <laughs> Michael. <laughs> and... Victoria. And we we are transients who somehow wound up as podcast editors. One day I just wandered into the studio and Casey gave me a job. Yeah. That is kind of how I did, actually. You know what? That's kind of <laughs> what happened to me, too. I was headhunted. Fair enough. That's interesting. Fair enough. I yeah. asked Casey for a letter of recommendation and he said, you don't need that. Come work for me. And I went, all right. And Casey <laughs> was like, you're not going to work there. You're going to work for me. He was right. I would not have worked there. <laughs> Today we're reading Gregor the Overlander, which is a children's book series by Suzanne Collins, who also wrote The Hunger Games. This was her first book series, I believe, before The Hunger Games. It's for fourth graders. But and fifth a, graders. And fifth graders. But there's lots of adult themes. In Common books. in these children's books. Common in these children's books. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's a book series that I hold near and dear to my heart. I was obsessed with it when I was a kid, uh, and then I forgot it existed. But now I've remembered... <laughs> Just in time to record Nostalgia Club. Wow. Wow. Uh, Michael, what about you? How How were you? How? 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 How did you stumble into these books? How on earth? That is the question, isn't it? Because normally one wouldn't subject themselves to what I think Suzanne Collins herself has described as like basically a metaphor for war and, and wartime and going through those uh, circumstances. How on earth would you as a child find and subject yourself to this more than once? <laughs> I actually do find that like a lot of children's books talk about war and like themes of conflict between like groups of people. It's very impressive and fascinating. And it's funny because you'll look at reviews that will laud the mature themes or more specifically, and I think more accurately, laud the ways in which mature themes are approached. But any review that specifically mentions, goodness, this children's book really addresses some mature themes. How impressive. I'm like, that's par for the course. <laughs> like, <laughs> you got to be more specific than that. Yeah. I feel like just about every book we read as a kid that wasn't specifically like a picture book, like addressed some significant issues about like, hey, get ready. Once you're an adult and a little before that, uh, depending on your life experience, this, this is going to become pretty uh, pretty, pretty common. You better get used to it now. Get it out of the way early. <laughs> yeah. I was going to say this for the Arthur episode, but I found myself surprised. I was I was thinking about like, wow, like the, all these books and all these shows we're, we're reviewing are a lot more mature and like treat their viewership more maturely than, than I remember. And I think it's just like I, I grew up and I just forgot that kids are way smarter and way mm -hmm. better at nuance and, and understanding these kinds of themes than adults give them credit for. That's true. I feel like adults are always like, oh, I don't like consume children's media because it's very like childish and like it doesn't have very deep messages. But then you look back and you're like, actually, I read all these things as a kid and like they kind of shaped the way that I see the world. I suppose. I don't know if you want to read it, Gino, because you are the 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 Gregor uh, the Gregor head? I don't the know. Head? I'm a, I'm a Greg head. <laughs> but just so everyone's up to speed, read the back of, of the book there that we have. Um, what do you call it? Rent Is rented the word? Um, borrowed from, borrowed, borrowed from, from the, the local library. library. Support wow. your library. Support your library. When Gregor follows his little... little mm. Mm. <laughs> when, when... Okay, start over. <laughs> <laughs> it's going in the episode. Oh, no. I'm in charge of that. When Gregor follows his little sister through a grate in the laundry room of their apartment building... He hurtles into the dark underland beneath the city. There, humans live uneasily besides giant spiders, bats, cockroaches, and rats. But the fragile peace is about to fall apart. Gregor wants no part of a conflict between these creepy creatures. But when he discovers that a strange prophecy foretells a role for him in the underland, he realizes it might be the only way to solve the biggest mystery of his life. Ba -ba -bum. This unforgettable novel by Susan Collins is the international bestseller author by the Hunger Games series and Richard Spence and Brigham Village. Wow. That was impressive. I that did was, not. That was not articulate. That was, no, that was great. That sounded wonderful. That sounded exactly like one of those medicine commercials. Yeah, but like no post-processing added. No yeah. sp speed up. You just perfectly enunciated all of that. Hire me, medicine. <laughs> big, big, big Pharma. Big Pharma. 
Call we have me. the next perfect narrator for you. <laughs> but yeah, so uh, one thing the, the back of the book doesn't specifically state, but is important to note, and you may have intuited it, is that those uh, other creatures besides humans, the giant spiders, bats, cockroaches, rats, they are all sentient, speaking, thinking creatures um, with their own unique ways of cognition and uh, strange sorts of cultures. They have society. They, they too live in a society. <laughs> and they are suffering because of it. Yeah. A major theme of this book series. Society it, suffers. Society suffers just over and over again, especially the people within it. I don't know if, Gino, did you, because uh, we all read this first book, Gregor the Overlander, the name of the first book in uh, the Underland Chronicles, total of five books. Did you Google the, the wikis for any of the subsequent books? Did I did. You, did you I, read all of them originally? I read all of them originally. I was one of those kids who, when they got when I got into a series, I would just read it over and over and over and over mm. again until oh. my mom would take it away because I was late for school. <laughs> so I got really into these books. I think one thing that stopped me, and this is kind of a, we're, we're kind of jumping out a lot here, but the ending of the fifth book really disappointed me. Mm. Like it like broke me to my core <gasps> in kind of like an emotional way. How old were you when you read um gregor oh man i've, I've got to say probably elementary it was one of those books where i'd read it and then i'd like leave it for a couple of years and i'd find mm. it again so i would say like maybe elementary middle school ish gotcha so a little a little older than perhaps the recommended age range but the ending is a good ending it's i think as an adult i look back and i think it's a legitimately good ending but because it's so open-ended and kind of depressing uh and it doesn't have that kind of like sparkly happy ending kind of vibe which is again a theme of these books not necessarily the happiest of the hunger games too of the hunger games yeah uh, the much more well-known of suzanne collins work but this is definitely it feels if anyone knows the hunger games who's listening and there's a fair chance you do because it was ubiquitous for a while yeah <laughs> very similar themes throughout both gregor and the hunger games the hunger games is perhaps more accessible to more readers because it's just kind of a loose uh sci-fi dystopia of the distant future, there's less you have to suspend disbelief for. For example, Hunger Games involves a post-apocalyptic United States where there is an autocratic government, which we've all believed at many times for many stories. <laughs> this involves a uh, prophetic Englishman uh, named uh, Bartholomew of Sandwich, who comes to the, <laughs> who comes to the nascent. I don't know if it was the British colonies at that time or the United States, but leads a whole group of people. Like It sounds like a cult. This guy sounds like he was the leader of a cult, and he was receiving prophecies that seem divinely inspired uh, in some degree. Like It seems like he's tapped into something. Um, and he leads a whole like group of people, several thousand strong, underground to this place called the Underland that exists below New York City. And there he lives out the rest of his life with this group of people setting up a society of humans called Regalia in the Underland and interacting with the various sentient species who exist there. Gi again, giant versions of much smaller non-sentient uh, <laughs> or sapient or who knows creatures that we know like rats and cockroaches and things. And that involves a lot of suspension of disbelief. And yet... It makes, and I was talking uh, to both of you, I think, but especially you, Gino, about this earlier, is that one of the themes that you think about um, between The Hunger Games and Gregor is the idea of, of being caught up in events larger than you mm. and the trauma of going through essentially wartime and all of the gray moral areas involved where no one is really a good guy. And the thing about Gregor that really, really lands with me is uh, compared to the world of The Hunger Games, for example... I know we're kind of like talking about two different properties in this one, but Katniss in The Hunger Games, the protagonist, her role is uh, an isolating one as she is sort of, she experiences a unique situation in terms of being involved in The Hunger Games, eventually becoming a symbol of the uh, rebellion against um, the capital, Pan Am, whatever. There's a very similar journey for, for Gregor involved in the sense that he gets swept up in events larger than him. He is considered what uh, the warrior in a number of prophecies uh, of the underland humans and as a result is placed in a similarly isolating kind of role where he has a lot of responsibility and doesn't know how to handle it because at the same time it's sort of his own destiny is divested from him and controlled by other people in a way um in this case fate as well uh the prophecies foretold by this earl of sand or uh, bartholomew sandwich and earl, earl of sandwich is the restaurant earl of sandwich is the restaurant <laughs> yeah i was like oh geez 
And yet at the same time, there's something about Gregor that lands in a different way, despite all the similarities between, say, Gregor and Katniss and their experiences, the idea of going to a place called the Underland and seeing such a strange, fantastical, and yet very dark and gritty sort of environment and a very tumultuous time within, I guess, the the history of the Underland, it's so much more isolating to think about. Because Gregor as a human, along with the other regalia humans, are existing in a place that isn't very hospitable, specifically Mm -hmm. to them. The Underland is dark, completely dark. There's no, like world built-in light source where, oh, the crystals glow and it illuminates the beautiful dark the caverns. mushrooms. Yeah, the, it's mostly just pitch black and the humans ride bats around and that's how they can do things outside of their illuminated city of regalia. Otherwise, you know, they just have torches and it's a constant sort of struggle for survival. And for Gregor, who especially in the first book has to go under and then come back out of that land, it really conveys this... I think, to me anyway, this idea of going through an extremely harrowing experience in life that you didn't know was necessarily possible and having to come back to the regular world and contend with that in a way that very few people will ever be able to understand. Um, In this first book, the only people that can really understand Gregor's experience are his little sister, who goes with him, uh, who is like too young to to yeah. really like even speak at the time to, she's two she's, she's like two first book. yeah she does not process anything that happens the entire book oh like yeah barely yeah and then she's his just father. along for the ride yeah and thank goodness because she's yeah. like the only source of comedic relief yeah. <laughs> in this book <laughs> and yet she proves also very important to the plot in a number of ways i love her She's, she's great. My favorite character. She's like the Swiss army knife of humans. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like they have a problem. They just like put the baby in front of it and the baby solves it with charisma. Boots. Boots, Boots. is her nickname. Yeah. And yeah, I just find it very fascinating. And even more so because just reading the wiki for for Gregor and the inspiration behind the the series, it was talking about uh, Suzanne Collins talking to her father a lot. Mm. in writing these books because her father was ex-military or at least he was i think in the air force or something you know i should probably make sure i get this right i do remember reading suzanne collins was like a military brat she was always moving around because of her family's connected to the military so her life was very unstable and um i know i know similarly the hunger game is also inspired by watching the news portray the war on tv so like that same just wartime environment wartime culture i think really inspired these kinds of stories for her So it looks like uh, Suzanne Collins' father, Michael J. Collins, uh, was a career Air Force officer and a military historian with a Ph.D. from Rutgers. He fought in Vietnam, which Collins chronicles in her autobiographical book for young children, A Year of the Jungle. Ooh. That's heavy. That's heavy. For children? (laughs) Yeah. um, Wow. If anyone can do it, I can believe it. Yeah. Yeah. She wrote Gregor. She wrote The Hunger Games. It's... Yeah. I just think like Suzanne Collins really like came out here with the mission of teaching children about not just like the horrors of war, obviously like, in a, like a toned down version, yeah. but also like the end of Gregor is like very like inspirational, even when like the whole world seems to be like against you and there's all this darkness around you, there's still hope to be found. Reading this book gave me a lot of clarity as to, like, why she also wrote The Hunger Games, too. So it's, like, really cool to, like, see all the different things she's done that are kind of in a similar vein. As we mentioned in the intro, there are spoilers involved, at least for the first book, but potentially for the whole series. Um, <laughs> Michael Michael shrugged when he said intro. <laughs> <laughs> we have yet to record it. Don't, don't worry about it. But as a function of that, uh, Gino, tell us a little bit about the main plot thrust of Gregor the Overlander, this first book here. Sure. So Gregor is a kid living in a tiny cramped apartment in New York City, which when I first read this book as a kid, I have a visceral memory of not being able to comprehend what that was. Growing up in, in South Texas, the concept of a cramped apartment building and then like having to go downstairs through your laundry in like a public laundry room, like my brain, like I just could not picture what that looked like. So that was that was fun to come back to now knowing what a New York apartment looks like. <laughs> um, tiny cramped New York apartment. His dad is not missing for a considerable amount of time. So he has been withdrawing almost from from school and from his life and just like focusing only on the here and now not thinking about the future not thinking about the fat past because they're both too painful he's had to take on additional responsibilities he's caring for his two younger sisters lizzie who is i think seven and then boots mm-hmm. who's two his mother works full time 
His grandmother is suffering from um, dementia, I believe. It seemed, I'm not sure if they specifically state it at They're all. Not, they don't specifically state it, but she, she is losing... Um, Cognitive functionality, yeah. full, full, her full awareness. She calls him Simon a lot, which is implied that maybe that was like her son or something. Yeah, yeah I had a question, like, is the Simon thing like his dad's name or but like gregor is like i don't know who simon is so it's like simon some other character does it come back later i i'll i admit i only read up to the third book originally because spoilers for the third book uh the third book's lesson is sometimes the enemy is uh within uh your <laughs> oh. own side sometimes oh, yeah. the disease that you're trying to uh fix within your society was actually born within your society oh. as a bioweapon to kill the enemy, which is very topical nowadays Wait, because what? that's a legitimate conspiracy theory for <laughs> a lot of recent oh, things. Yeah, oh, yeah, oh, yeah. We'll slight... probably take that out of the yeah. <laughs> episode. I just wanted to tell you that. Slight, slight side tangent, but I believe Gregor's grandmother actually provides a little bit of very nuanced character backstory for like the family in general because i believe she mentions i think it's like a farm in georgia that she's visioning she's picturing in these in these visions which means uh and i don't know if i'm stretching this but the family moved pretty recently from georgia to new york to try to make a better life mm. and then the dad disappears all of a sudden so adding more layers to like their their family struggles and like presumably coming from like a spacious farm on georgia to this tiny cramped apartment yeah so Gregor's not doing great. He's, <laughs> he's trying. He's, he's admirably trying to do the best he can to take care of his sisters and his mother and his grandma. And then he goes downstairs to do laundry with his little sister Boots. Boots falls down a laundry chute or, or some kind of air duct. It's like an open grate that's like behind yeah. the laundry machine. And she's like playing and she finds it. And then Gregor's like, don't go near that. And then she's like, I'm going to go in. And then they both get sucked in because I think there's like air currents. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which is what his dad, when they find him, also says happened. He found a grate and then the air current pulled him in. Like it wasn't like I went in to see for myself. It was like I was physically like sucked in by like these air currents. Yeah. So clearly this building is not up to code. <laughs> yeah. No one has inspected this great. Gregor falls for a very long time. Like I think the book says like more than five minutes of falling. Yeah. Which is a long time to fall. And and obviously he's being cushioned by the air currents, but still, they're they're going deep. He lands in the underland. One he's, of the higher higher areas, perhaps. Higher like, areas, maybe. Maybe. He is found by a a Victoria's favorite animal. A large group of giant sentient cockroaches who speak in a fantastic sort of cadence. Okay, I just have to say, before I read this, I have a difficult relationship with cockroaches, but this book made me like two specific cockroaches, but only those two. <laughs> tick, tick and temp. The two yeah. best cockroaches. But I was like, oh, like, they're so good. And I was like, I can't believe this is happening. <laughs> they think Boots is a princess. Yeah, yeah, they are literally hypnotized by her beauty and her funny little dances and her sing songs. And I, I think... I would too. Yeah. I'd be like, oh my God, you're so cute. Be she the princess, be she? <laughs> and it seems like their culture is obsessed with time, which I think is why their names are Tick and Temp. Those are both yeah. like time-based. Time in the Underland equates to life. It's just slang for life. That is what their whole society appears to be focused on. The cockroaches, thanks to Boots, don't immediately turn them over to the rats. We're going to eat them. Big, scary rats. Because the cockroaches are kind of like just general middlemen in a way. Yeah. Um, like they a just neutral sort of, party. A neutral party. They just sort of do various almost mercantile dealings with whatever faction will give them, again, more life. Mm -hmm. Or time. <sighs> wow, I screwed <laughs> up the term. <laughs> yeah, this book very quickly establishes like a, a basic economy. In the underground, they they trade like they in baskets trade with, amongst yeah. themselves. Each group has like a resource that the other groups need, mm. yeah. and so the cockroaches take them to, or what are they called in the land? The crawlers. Crawlers, crawlers. Yeah. yeah. The crawlers take them to the humans. They meet some royalty, uh, Luxa, the see-through princess, Ficus, the see-through king, <laughs> all the see-through guards. The underground people are see-through. Yeah, I love the ways that Suzanne Collins describes strange, kind of fantastical or loosely science fictional concepts from the perspective of a child. Like when Gregor looks at the underland humans who, for our understanding, have skin that is so pale that you can kind of see through it. 
the way that Suzanne Collins describes it in Gregor's point of view is that it makes him think of a science textbook where he's like, you know, on one page you have the human anatomy Mm -hmm. with the digestive tract highlighted. Another page is the skeletal system highlighted. Mm -hmm. These people look like a human diagram with the circulatory system highlighted. And it's such a distinct picture and one so well drawn from the perspective of however old Gregor is, like 12 or something. Yeah, I think it also works so well because, like, everyone has seen those pictures in textbooks growing up. So, like, you immediately know what these people look like because you're like, oh, I know exactly what those diagrams look like. So I know what these people look like. It's even better, too, because it also reinforces Gregor's character as the son of a a science teacher. Yeah, I really liked the flashbacks to when Gregor would do science experiments with his dad or like just in general how his dad instilled in him a love for science. And at the very end, when his dad teaches him how to make a compass, I was like, oh, it's his dad. (laughs) I don't know. This this is just one thing that I've always found really, really fascinating. And I don't know if there's an organic way to bring this up or not. But in both of Suzanne Collins' series, it's heavily implied that the main protagonists are either brown-skinned or black. Yes. Which I think is very cool. It's never like explicitly stated, but it's something that even as a kid, like when I realized that, I was like, that's that's really neat. Because I, up to then, I never read a book series with a black protagonist. Like it just wasn't done as yeah. a kid. I noticed that because I was also going to comment on like the great way that she has of describing what people look like because I love the moment where like Boots just is like purple and then we're like why is she shouting purple and it turns out all the Underlanders have purple eyes. Luxa is like oh like your skin is brown and must you must require so much sunlight for that and I was like that's such like a good way just to like hey this is what their family looks like. And it's how the rats discover that Not specifically that Gregor is of the overland, because they can tell that from his scent, but specifically that he is connected to his father, whom they have captured. Because that specific detail is one thing that would let the rats know that, oh, maybe this is the warrior from the prophecy. Mm -hmm. And early in the book, the first rats that Gregor encounters, like, there's two of them. One of them goes like, mark you, his shade, or something like that. Like the shade of his skin. I I actually ended up Googling it, and it seems a very prevalent Google, like, is Gregor black? Mm -hmm. And there's... I don't know like where this came from. It seems like just form answers of people like not really sure or like, no, nah, he's just, it's just like he's not black, but it's like a tanner skin. And I'm like, I don't know how much I believe that. Yeah. I think Greater's <laughs> black. If nothing else, I would like to believe that amid so many fantasy novels that are specifically like just, you know, uh, European descent, uh, standard Anglo white characters, we, we get a stem. <laughs> <laughs> STEM person of color for these fantasy books. So it'd be nice. And it was, again, it was something that as a kid, I didn't even realize. I was just like reading through like, oh, look, rats. Oh, look, cockroaches. Oh, look. <laughs> oh, look, rats. Wow. <laughs> this is really dark. <laughs> wow. Literally <laughs> and of death? emotionally. Yes. Yeah, literally and emotionally. Uh, but reading back, I was like, oh, wait a minute. This is very, like you said, Victoria, very well done. So, Victoria, tell us a little bit about the main journey that everyone goes on, because Gregor arrives in the Underland, and then he's told by Vicus, grandfather of Luxa, the princess who has yet to inherit the throne because her parents were killed by rats. He is told there's a prophecy about him, and there are expectations for him and others uh, to do something very important. So tell us about the main journey. It does follow, like, a very, like, classic hero's journey, A quest. A quest in which Gregor shows up. Everyone is pretty much immediately like, you're the chosen one. And then he's like, no. (laughs) And then he tries to leave. But in leaving, he like sets himself up for the quest. It's like really interesting. He's very introspective is what I noticed about this character for like being so young. But he's like, I feel like the reason why I'm the chosen one is because I tried to escape. It's almost like free will versus like... Predestination. Predestination, (laughs) yeah. That's a big theme that gets really explored, I think, in the fourth and fifth book. Mm. Is like Gregor's free will, his ability to choose. Yeah. Because these prophecies keep coming back and they keep being pretty accurate. And Gregor, at at the end, Gregor's like, it doesn't matter what I do. Am I just a puppet that's forced to just walk on these horrible, horrible paths, these horrible mm-hmm. strings? And again, that, that you know, from the uncritical eye, you may think of it like a fantasy trope in a way where it's like, well, it's just, you know, a convention of prophecy and narratives with some element of mysticism. But especially coming from the perspective of a series of novels that are sort of war stories in a way. I mean, I've never been to war. I've never been in extreme conflict, but I don't think it's an extremely foreign concept to imagine 
being a person stuck in a situation that is larger than you and having that same feeling of, does anything that I do individually here matter? Like, how much control do I really have over my circumstances? Yeah. Yeah, so he is forced to take on this mantle of being the warrior, mainly because he just wants to find his dad and get his sister home. Because his dad was kidnapped by rats. The story does a really good job of, like, even though, like, Gregor is running away, it, like, slowly backs him into a corner where he's like, I guess the only way for me to get what I want is by playing along. So they assemble, like, this crew. There's, like, a prophecy that says, like, they have to have, like, this many... Um, party members and then four of them are gonna die which is like I guess the ongoing mystery throughout the rest of the book I did think that like the first two who died were probably the least impactful it was just like the spider that we've met for literally two seconds yeah. <laughs> immediately dies I was like okay well that was easy and then I can't who was the second one the second one was uh was the Tick. I think it was uh, Tick. Yeah, it was Tick. The okay, I take it back. Least. The second death was impactful. But <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's and it happened so quickly. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and it and it's a willing death, which it's, you don't always get in these books. It's a heroic sacrifice. Yes. Tick sacrifices herself to save Boots and Temp from pursuing rats. Mm-hmm. And then we get another spider. <laughs> and then and then the other spider dies. Yeah. <laughs> these poor spiders. They do so much. The spiders. I know the, the spiders like weave clothes for them and like diapers for Boots. Yeah. Spiders are pretty cool. They just get taken out. Yeah, they just decked. They were like, okay, you have enough diapers now. We can kill the spiders. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, the spiders enter enter the story near the third act. Yeah. But at the same time, that's not even like an excuse of like, oh, that's why you don't get to know him. Because another character enters at the very end stage of their journey. um, And he's one of the best characters of all. (laughs) Oh, he's so good. Tell us about Rip Red, Victoria. So Rip Red is basically like their guide through the territory that the humans have not mapped out because it's mainly like, if I'm not mistaken, like rat territory. Yeah. Because, like, they went through the cockroach territory, they went through the spider territory, and now they're in, like, very uncharted territory because, like, the rats are fully their enemy, so they've never been here. And so Vicus, who's the grandfather, gets them in contact with Rip Red, who I guess is kind of like, he's... It's implied that... He's like he the he's knew. like the yellow fang. <laughs> yeah, oh my gosh! Yeah, uh, listen to the Warrior Cats episode. Yeah, he's like the yellow fang of the Rat Society, where like he doesn't like the new leader, and so he left, and he's like kind of just existing on the outskirts and like waiting for an opportunity to take back the I don't even like the Rat kingdom. Society. Like I don't know what to call it. Yeah. For a more Suzanne Collins-based analogy, uh, Rip Red is very much like, if you've read the Hunger Games series, uh, Plutarch Heavensby, who is Philip Seymour oh. Hoffman's character. Uh, sort of, you know, let's call it industry insider on the yeah. antagonist side who is disillusioned with the system and plots to overthrow it and make it something more humane. Obviously, the humans are not stoked about their guide. Especially, like, the two Underlander humans, who are Luxa and Henry. Henry is Luxa's cousin. Yes, because both their parents were killed by rats. So they're really like, rats are never our friends, they're never going to be our friends. And Rip Red doesn't do a lot to disabuse him of the notion. Yeah. Because he's an old, salty guy, and he's, like, pretty, um, uh, what do you call it, pretty gruff and sort mm-hmm. of, um, uh, what's the word irreverent yeah with a lot of things i think he's just like i've been through so much i don't care if you hate me or not if you want my help i'm here if you don't then good luck yeah mutual need is the thing he says mutual need is better than trust Yeah. yeah yeah i think gregor also because of like one of his first experiences in the underland is getting attacked by rats so he's also like i don't know how i feel about this one but like he seems okay and he admits that like they do need him to like accomplish their quest but i guess the big turning point in the book is gregor wakes up in the middle of the night and henry is about to kill rip red in his sleep this is leading into what ultimately becomes henry's betrayal which is that he has sold them out to the rats the whole crew after losing some members finally find gregor's dad Oh, it was so chilling, the end of the chapter, when Gregor describes what his dad looks like. The figure turns around, and Gregor saw what was left of his father. 
brutal. My first thought was like, they were talking about how like they suspected that Gregor's dad was helping the rats with experiments and like creating weaponry for them. And so my first thought was like, what if, I don't know, he has like an arm chopped off and like he's just become like an android type person. I don't know. That was my (laughs) immediate reaction. But then it was like the very next chapter was like, no, he's just become a shadow of his former self. And he's ill, which is implied to be because of the lack of sunlight, which is also, I think, what Boots is going through. I don't know why Gregor doesn't go through it, but. I think Boots just catches a virus. Okay. So he's just baby sick. But Gregor's dad is deprived of sunlight. Sick. Yeah, deprived of sunlight. Probably not deprived treated of well. Food, yeah, yeah. Not he's been well. held prisoner by the rats. He's been a POW for two years. Yeah, wearing rat skin. Wearing rat skin, kind of not very lucid. <laughs> yeah, because mm-hmm. he's just feverish. He's had like this perpetual infection. It seems for a while. Yeah, yeah, he's out of it for most of his introduction chapter. He's not aware of anything that's happening. It's very harrowing. Yeah. So just as we've reached the moment of victory, obviously it all has to come crashing down. They're like, great, we can hurry back to regalia and the day is saved and then henry is like no the day is not saved (laughs) and he like summons like this army of rats and then like luxa and also henry's bonded bat Ares. oh because this is a thing in the series something we haven't mentioned all the human underlanders have like a bat most do most of them do it's like how the airbenders in Avatar The Last Airbender have bison. Ah, that's a good analogy. That they're bonded yeah. with. When you're a kid, you like choose your bison or whatever. So this is what happens. They choose their bat. And the bats are sentient speaking creatures with yes. their own thoughts and opinions. With their own greek theme society. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Athena. They all have, yeah. And Euripides. Yeah, and the Ares. names are great. So no one knew about Henry's betrayal, not even... Not even his bat. Not even his bat. The bond between a human and their bat is like... Culturally sacred. Yeah. And not even his cousin who grew up with him and like... Shared in his trauma. Yeah, considers him like her best friend probably. So they're super betrayed. They're kind of at a loss of what to do. And then Gregor, thinking of the prophecy, thinks that he's supposed to be the last one to die. This is also such a great payoff. Earlier in the series, there's a scene where, like, Luxa just, like, or one of the Underlanders just throws Boots off, like... A pillar. A pillar. And she, like, flies to the air. And, but she's, like, she's having a great time. She's two years old. She doesn't know. And Gregor just, like, flips out. He's, like, you can't just throw a baby over a balcony. Like, she's going to think she can just jump off anything and be caught. And they're, like, yeah, of course she can. He's, like, not in the overland. Yeah. So it becomes, like, this huge... Point of tension between him and the Underlanders because the Underlanders know that Gregor really looks down on them and like doesn't like their society. And Gregor is like angry because they're putting like everyone at risk. So but, I know, Boots does get caught by the bats. Yes, yes, Boots is fine. The bats like play catch with her basically yeah. and they just like fling her around like a trampoline. Yeah. <laughs> so she's fine. Afterwards, she's like, more again and gregor's like no again boots very important for this book yeah Yeah, the one person keeping things light i love boots she's either using her charisma to like get the cockroaches to work for them yeah the cockroaches basically worship her like a god yeah Yeah. the scene where like the cockroaches like stand in a circle and like sway around her i was like oh my gosh she's the only reason the cockroaches end up deciding to help the humans Mm -hmm. is because she's like able to tell them apart or something for mystical reasons that we don't understand and the cockroaches which is are just like I think Boots is just observant him. like a smart kid for others who like kind of look down on the crawlers like uh, they're kind of gross yeah. they don't care to distinguish like one from the other but Boots is like just pure innocent yeah, Boots loves cares. everyone yeah and she cares about everyone yeah there's a lot of contention about the ways that these different species essentially like look at each other especially perspectives toward the crawlers as like they may be able to like speak and think but they're not like high cognition organisms and there's one character in particular who espouses that ideology rather vehemently and that is henry who again when he betrays everyone is revealed to be a secret racist or like (laughs) species supremacist i don't know if secret is the right word (laughs) he's pretty vocal about it i I guess so but it is stated that like a lot of underland humans have that opinion of cockroaches uh, of the crawlers not just cockroaches it's implied that they think about that for every species except for the rats. Pretty much. Because the rats are like their equals in combat. It's implied that humans have only lasted this long because they are the ones with opposable thumbs. Yeah, that's one thing that really fascinated me. I had m- many moments of like locking to this world in this book as I was like rediscovering it going along. But the moment where I like really locked back in again 
to like the idea of like the world um, and the progression of things was when Vicus tells Gregor like, yes, the rats have your father. We believe they are using him to have him design weapons for them so that they're better able to basically fight us because we can ride bats. They're very, the rats are very lethal up close, but we have range on our side and mobility. The rats are using your father to design like long range weapons and bombs and things. But more than that, most importantly, we believe they are using your father to design them a prosthetic thumb so that they can build and control things for themselves the way we can. And that's when I was like, Oh, here we go. Yeah. We're back at big brain world building time <laughs> Yeah, because it, It really solidifies the idea that this is a society of creatures that, even though they have only been described as antagonistic this entire time and have only behaved antagonistically in the ways that we've seen them, it shows that they have an ambition and a creative instinct, even if it's primarily at this moment used for war, that goes beyond the boundary of the prophecy and this idea that there is a warrior that will cause them a lot of trouble. It shows that they have desires and expectations for life beyond their current circumstance and Mm -hmm. beyond just violent conflict and war which is just very interesting and i'm not sure that that ever that subplot ever makes a reappearance the idea that they're they want a thumb design for themselves i don't know i know the rats society gets explored in great detail in later books i don't know about the thumb specifically do we want to cover the rest of the books I do want us to make sure we talk about the end. Oh, Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I was getting to the what I consider to be one of the most like cinematic moments of the book, which is when Gregor decides he's going to be the fourth person to die and runs off because he knows that because he's like the chosen one that the rats will follow him, that they'll to kill him. Yeah, to kill him and leave the others alone because he's the most important one that they need to get rid of. But the road comes up short. and It's then, like a, just a canyon, just a long yeah. drop. And so he jumps. I was like seeing it in slow motion, just him like leaping through the air. And then after that, it gets even better because then he starts falling. And it's like kind of a callback to the beginning of the book where he's falling to the Underland. But this time he's like choosing to fall. He's like kind of accepted it. And it's not a fun fall this time because it's very fast and he will surely die if he hits the ground. And then he kind of like looks behind him and it turns out all the rats and Henry, who's fighting with the rats now, have followed him off the cliff like lemmings. Part of it is that the edge of the canyon there, the cliff like gave way under Mm -hmm. their combined weight. Basically, he like led a great group of rats to their demise. Including uh, the main antagonistic rat, who we oh, never yeah. get much of, a King Gorger or King Gorger. Gorger. Yeah. When I was a kid, I read it as Gorger. Me too, me too. <laughs> and then Ares comes back. Ares, Henry's bat. They have this explanation early on. A bat who's bonded to their human, like, is basically, like, bound to them, like, life and death. They must always follow them. And to break that vow is like a huge crime and you'll be banished to a lifetime of solitude. Which is basically a death sentence in the Underland. And so Gregor sees Ares fly down is like he's going to save Henry because he kind of has to, even if like he didn't know that Henry betrayed them and whatnot. But Ares completely skips Henry and saves Gregor instead. So in the end, Henry is the last one to die. And then the day is saved and they go back to Regalia and then Gregor ends up being bonded to Ares because the council is like, Ares broke his vow, like he should be banished. And Gregor's like, come on, guys. He didn't know. Like, what was he supposed to do? Like, save this dude who like treason? Yeah, Yeah, who like completely like betrayed everyone. So Gregor's like, I choose you as my bat if you will have me. And then the council can't banish him because he's like the warrior's bat now. Gregor finally realizes the political power of his situation. Yeah. And then the Underlanders are like, okay, you saved us. You can go home now, which I kind of wish we had a little bit more of. I wanted to see like the mom's reaction. It's like another one of those moments where like I understand why it ended like that. But I'm also like, there's always a little part of me that wants just a little bit more, just like a little bit more closure. You get you get more of the mom in later books. Yeah. Basically, like my last thought after finishing the book was like it kind of ended pretty seamlessly like there weren't too many loose ends there was like oh there's another prophecy but like don't worry about it (laughs) so it makes me curious like did she write the book as like a standalone and then after it got popular write more books it's possible though it did get published through scholastic and they usually do like series Mm. orders i believe this is the only book that ends so neatly the rest of the books have 
more like troubles brewing, troubles brewing, troubles really brewing like endings. I will say every victory that our characters have is a Pyrrhic one. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And it's interesting because even in this book, the import and the cinematicness of Gregor leaping and falling and all these rats falling with him and him being caught by Ares, it's a very fast moment. Mm -hmm. There is a slow motion where he is running and the import of that decision. But King Gorger, the antagonist of Gret that we hear about a number of times throughout the book, we meet him for a scene and then he essentially dies off screen. We hear like, oh, he died in the fall. Mm -hmm. Literally below screen. Yeah, li below, below screen. screen. <laughs> <laughs> he dies, the rats die, and the conflict becomes like, great, we killed King Gorger, we saved Gregor's father, but now it looks like we're all going to die. And the major, like the main focus of the end of the book has to do with when Gregor is stuck in the rats territory with Boots, who is sick with fever, and Ares, who saved him but is despondent because he just let Henry die, and Luxa, who is in shock. Um, and Lux's bat, who is injured, and Gregor's like, I am the only person here who can do anything. They had given his father medicine, and we spend, like Victoria said, a long and very lovely moment of Gregor reconnecting with his father and his father teaching him how to make a compass in real mm -hmm. time compared to all those flashbacks. And the amount of time we spend in the aftermath of the main moment of essentially violence, the main focus is, is on the events after it and the ramifications of those things. It just, it works for the series. It works for what it's trying to do. This series really likes to focus on consequences. There is no war without suffering. There is no violence without suffering. Uh, tell us about the many Pyrrhic victories and consequences of this series in future books, Gino, because you're the only one of us who has read all the way through. I did refresh myself uh, last night, but I, I'm kind of going off memory, so I apologize if there are some small inaccuracies or large inaccuracies. <laughs> but I won't apologize for those. Um, <laughs> but in the second book, Basically, Gregor's mother has a an understandable reaction and immediately takes the family out of New York. Yes. If you find out that, like, the reason that your husband disappeared for, like, two years and then your children disappeared for a few days and it's because, like, two of the portals to the Underland are in New York. <laughs> are I'd in be your like, apartment complex. I'd be like, goodbye. <laughs> yeah. This is a totally lateral move, but um, <laughs> speaking of moving, moving her family out of New York, because of course you would. Yes. That's something that should have happened a long time ago in Stranger Things. <laughs> 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 the Byers family should have gotten out of there the moment they got Will back. That's I don't know true. why yeah, on yeah. earth. I mean, look, I get it. It's good that they stayed because they were honestly the only people that could contend with the forces of the Upside Down coming at them. Yeah. But for heaven's sake, if I you're a like, mom, you are getting out of them. Yeah. Like, I can, like, kind of understand being, like, well, like, Will's been, just been through a lot, and he wants to just stay near his friends. But I'm still, like, I don't know. I'd be, like, you can, your friends can visit. You can find new friends. You gotta <laughs> get out of it. This is life or death. You gotta get out of yeah. it. Yeah. So, yeah, Gregor's family moved to, I think, back to, like, Virginia? Or I think it's Virginia. Virginia to stay with her uncle or something. Is there another portal in Virginia? So I believe what happens is that because there's no way Gregor's going to like waltz back into the other land. None of his family have any motivation to do that. So the solution is they kidnap Boots. <gasps> the, Underlanders. the Underlanders kidnap Boots and they just take her back. And Gregor's like, yes, I got to go back because wow. why would you do that? Gregor goes back and there's a second prophecy, prophecy of Bane. And they're like, Gregor the Warrior, you need to kill the white rat Bane. It's supposed to be this horribly evil, destructive rat. It's like an ocean voyage. They get on a ship. There's like an ocean in the Underland? There's a big ocean in the Underland. We, we see it at the end of the first book. Yeah. Remember oh, they fly right, out over right. the water? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hollow Earth the Theory. Hints. Hollow Earth Theory. <laughs> um, they fight some ocean monsters. I can't remember if this is the one, if the second or third one, but Luxa is not assigned to this quest and just shows up anyway, mm. which causes problems later. She's like, I also want to be included. Yeah. But uh, the, so the main crux of the second book, which is ironically the one I remember the least. So maybe you might be able to refresh me as well. I also uh, remembered it the least as I was wicking it. Yeah. <laughs> but the whole idea is there's a lot of political tension within the rats. Now that the leader's dead, Rip Red's trying to make moves. Mm. Other rats are trying to make moves. And it turns out Bane is a baby. This is a kill baby Hitler. <gasps> story this is a kill baby hitler does, story. does gregor kill baby hitler of course gregor doesn't kill baby hitler yeah gregor rejects the prophecy and gives bane to rip red they name bane pearl pelt after the white fur and gregor's basically like please do your best to raise this child to be a good person so we can just avoid this whole thing because of course that's gonna happen yeah and rip red does his best does his best <laughs> 
The third book is Curse of the Warm Blood, and that's the one where we get the, guess what, sometimes your worst enemy is from within. Sometimes the disease ravaging your society is actually a bioweapon created <laughs> by uh, Solovet, uh, Vicus's <gasps> wife, who we initially suspect is very kind and sweet like Vicus. Vicus. I keep calling him Vicus in my head. But in even in this book, Vicus says, like, take care as they're preparing for war with the rats. Like, my wife uh, may seem very sweet and kind, but she is as cunning and deft in war strategy as a rat. And in the third book, it's revealed that she commissioned the creation of a bioweapon by this uh, scientist, and they keep it a secret, and they send Gregor out into the jungle to meet with Vicus and Solovet's estranged son Ooh. who rides a frill lizard. Ooh. And he's like a pacifist who understands what kind of person Solovet can truly be. He's also a halfland. He's half overland, half underland. His son is halfland. His, his son is halfland. His gotcha. son named Hazard. Ooh. Yeah, and so a halflander is uh, born of an underland and an overland parent. I think Hazard is like the only halflander we know about. So I can't remember exactly, but there is a plot point in either the second or third book where Luxa basically joins the quest unannounced without permission. And then during a climactic battle, they basically have to abandon Luxa, her bat and Temp. They have to leave them behind. I believe that's the second one. I'm so glad that Temp is a recurring character. Temp is a recurring character. Yes. <laughs> Temp's great. Temp's another like much like Boots keeps the keeps the tone light in certain areas. Yeah. Temp's entire entire character drive is I will quest for Boots. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Complete side note. But one of the favorite moments. Uh, well, I guess I had a lot of favorite moments. But another favorite moment in the first book is when the two cockroaches join them, and they're like, there's like a huge debate about which bat is gonna carry the cockroaches. Because, like, yeah. they're like, we don't want to carry the cockroaches, but the cockroaches refuse to ride on a bat that Boots is not on. Yeah. But then, like, Boots ha has to be with Gregor. So it's like suddenly there's, like, four passengers on one bat, and the bat's like, I can't do that. <laughs> it's so funny. All four passengers don't know how to ride a bat. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Two of them don't have hands. <laughs> like, it's a whole thing. Uh, one of them's so a baby. Good. But, yeah, Gregor returns, goes back up into the overland. Again, no way. They're ever going to get him back down there. Yeah. Except then, in the third book, the Overlander show up and says, hey, there's a plague ripping through our city. We really need your help. Everyone you know from the Underland is going to die. Ooh. And Gregor's like, I guess I got to go. And Poor his Gregor. mom is like, no, I'm coming with you. Which Ooh. is what a mom would do. I'm going to supervise this field trip this time. Mom! And of course, she just instantly gets sick. Aww. And so Gregor's got to go on that quest to find the cure. That was yeah. personal. <laughs> Which they don't. Because the moment they find this flower or whatever that's supposed to be the cure, a bunch of ants called um, cutters, mm -hmm. which we never see, I think, like anywhere else in the books, but they're described as hating all warm bloods and wanting to wipe Ooh. them out. They sweep through. They kill a number of characters, specifically the frill lizard and Vicus and Solovet's estranged son, though his son survives. And the ants take out all the flowers and our characters just fail and they have to go back. Mm -hmm. and say we didn't get the cure and that's when it's revealed that the scientists already developed a cure oh. because again it came from their Them. own research yeah. and development their whole quest was in vain their whole quest was, was so was all those people died for, for nothing. nothing yeah wait so why war did... story war yeah, yeah. story so what was the point of like sending them on the quest <laughs> to to find this uh plant this flower that was supposed to i think it's described as a cradle cure no i meant like what did like Sullivan want them to go on the quest for? She's she like a that. distraction, basically convincing them that this was not a man-made plague. There must be an outside like cure. Yeah, ah. it was pure manipulation. It was, it, oh. was a, it was a complete diversion. But why did she create the plague in the first place? To use it as a bioweapon against the rats. Mm. So, so was it like she created it to use against the rats, but then accidentally unleashed it? I think that humans? was the situation. Gotcha. A classic. A classic. They jumped in the river and then people drank the water. <laughs> yeah. So uh, they end up executing the scientist who was commissioned to do this. The scientist who also created the cure for it and put Solovet on trial. But she, you know, she doesn't face punishment for her actions. They keep her alive. Yeah. I don't know how if she doesn't. I just know that she's alive in future books to lead the armies of the Underland against the rats. Yeah. Wow. The third book also introduces, basically, they find Luxa, Temp, and uh, her bat. In the jungle. In the jungle, yeah. Living with a colony of mice. Yeah. This is the fourth book? This is the third book. Third book. So okay. first book is cave adventure. Second mm -hmm. book is ocean adventure. Third, third book, book is, is jungle adventure. I was about to say, like, there's so many, like, and, uh, locations. Biomes, yeah. <laughs> the third book, I remember, also did a lot of world building. 
Luke's has been living with a colony of nibblers, which are mice. Aww. Nibblers are so cute. They're small and they like they farm and they're like have families. They're so good. They're great. <laughs> uh, don't get too attached to them. <laughs> <laughs> there are societies of butterflies. There are societies of snails. We Wait, never really is this them. all underground? This is all underground. all underground. How are there butterflies underground? I don't know. How are there? How, how is this hollow earth theory? Yeah. <laughs> no, like when I read the first book, I was just like, everything is dirt. And then suddenly you're like, also, there's an ocean. Also, there's a junk, like ocean I can kind of understand. But then like jungle. What's the fourth book? Uh, Fourth book is, is volcano. V- volcano. Um, okay, that and also makes a little more the sense. Holocaust. Oh yeah, what? I shouldn't have said that with like a weird upturn in my voice. I'm just uncomfortable. It's important for the kids to learn this when they're young, so that our future generations do not repeat the mistakes of the past. Yes. The fourth book is volcanoes. Oh, also third book, really quick. The rats do get the plague, and Ooh. Gregor makes the decision to give the rats the cure to uh, try to improve relations between the two species. Uh, Gregor is so good. Gregor is so good. Fourth book, Rip Red's been kicked out. Bane has grown up. Pearl Pelt has grown up. He's basically been manipulated by a group of rats to become this giant vicious monster killing mm-hmm. machine. So he's still he's still a, like a young rat, mm-hmm. but he is malleable. So he has become Bane. Yeah. Gregor, you merely adopted the dark. <laughs> <laughs> he has become Bane. The nibblers are vanishing. Their nests are empty. We don't know where they are. Lux is like, listen, these people saved me. We got to go save them. Gregor's like, I have a crush on you, Luke. So Luke's is like, what? <laughs> I don't think about it. Literally, they go on a date in order to sneak away. The date's not real, but like that's their whole like excuse. Excuse. Interesting. Young okay. Gino shipped these two so hard. <laughs> Honestly, though, I mean, I think even in just this first book, the, the seeds of two people that that would become close, if only because of the shared circumstances that they've been through and the shared drama. It makes a certain amount of sense, even if it's not necessarily healthy. Uh, uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> so they find the nibblers. The rats have basically gathered all the nibblers into a volcano and are just going to poison gas all of them. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Because they're evil. Yikes. Gregor is mildly successful in getting them out. The darkest part of this book is that the, the prophecy for this book, it's a children's song that Boots learns in the Underland. So do they think that Boots gave them a prophecy they figured out that this is one of sandwich's prophecies but because it kind of rhymed like a children's song it just became an underland children's song oh it's like catch the nibble in the trap watch the nibbler sni- so snip boots is snap. like singing the song throughout the book and they're yeah. like we don't have a prophecy this time we don't know what's gonna happen and the whole time boots is like singing the prophecy i believe the book begins with luxa and gregor like attending like a ball they have to dance together the, all the kids gather around and sing this fun little song and then later to feel that's Ring a genocide around the song. rosy a pocket full of posies. yeah exactly this book ends with basically the rats led by Bane are like, all right, let's just destroy the humans like once and for all. And they drag Gregor back to the prophecy room. And like, here's the final prophecy. It says you're going to die. The warrior dies like explicitly. The warrior Dang. has to die. And Gregor's like, I need to lie down. So he lies <laughs> down on the floor. And then the fifth book starts and he's still lying on the floor. Oh, the other books, you they know, all, that's a mood. Yeah, the other books, all there's like a few months break between yeah. them. Yeah, I think his family's down in the underland now. Lizzie's trying to like L- crack these puzzles. Lizzie is his other younger sister yeah. that we don't get much of in the other yeah. books. Sandwich has left these puzzles for the underlanders to solve because of course he did. They're like, let's put Boots in front of the puzzles to solve the puzzles. And Boots like, I'm a baby, I can't read. And they're like, <laughs> we didn't think this through. So they drag Lizzie down because Lizzie loves puzzles because she went to like Poor puzzle Lizzie. camp. Lizzie's the only one in the family who's like not traumatized by the underland and they're like just kidding you're coming too <laughs> this is the family legacy they drag yeah. Lizzie down just shove her in a room with these puzzles and lock the door and they're like good luck Rip Red develops a connection to her yeah. from what I read in the wiki Rip Red's still cool Gregor finally picks up the sword he's like I guess I gotta kill Bane there's a climactic battle Ares basically dies during the battle letting Gregor like land a killing blow essentially Gregor kills Bane he's like I'm not dead what happened Rip Red uh, basically leads a little coup and ascends the rat ranks and becomes rat leader and is like, stop the fighting rats. I'm really sparking through this. Yeah. <laughs> That's okay. Um, I'm still fascinated. Like, I really want to re- finish reading this series. It's like a full siege. Like, we didn't see the siege in book one. We see the full siege in book five. Oh, Nerissa. 
Nerissa is, if you remember Henry, the betrayer from the first book, Henry, Nerissa is Henry's ca- sister. 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 Nerissa has a very small part. She's like frail. She's timid. She becomes queen at one point and she has to lead. When Luxa disappears in the second book, oh, Nerissa okay. ascends the throne so, and she does her best. So at the end, Luxa has, I, I, she's either queen or she's general or she's some high military rank. Because Solovet uh, gets, does she get killed off screen in the fifth book? Just from the way it was written in the wiki, it implies, because it says Solovet and a few other Underlanders are killed in a rat ambush in the fifth book. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. But, you know, Solovet created a bioweapon. Maybe she had a gun. <laughs> I believe the Nibblers are also living with the Underlanders now, it would, it which would is causing sense. some tension. But basically, after the war, Rip Red and Luxa lead like a council to try to like draw new lines in the Underland territories and like reestablish treaties and boundaries. And it immediately goes south. And Rip Red and Luxa just immediately declare war on each other right there. Wow. Because they cannot decide on who's at fault. Because, like, Underlanders certainly... So they're just right back to war. They're just right back at it. And they're both like, Gregor, join our side. And Gregor's like, I am done with this. I'm going to kill the warrior right now. And he snaps the sword in half. Because, totally glossed over this, Gregor has, like, a battle rage mode. Where he gets oh, yeah, angry huh. and he, like, goes Super Saiyan and, like... And like oh, blacks out. And, like, is that the sword stuff? that like Vicus offers to him yeah. at the end of the first book? Which is a very interesting moment because at the end of the first book, there's still hope that Gregor says, I don't want to be a warrior. Yeah. I don't want to wield Bartholomew of Sandwich's sword. Mm-hmm. I want to be like you, Vicus. I want to be a diplomat. And Vicus yeah. is like, I'm very pleased to hear that. I hope yeah. you never have to pick this sword up. Spoiler alert, he has to pick he the has sword, to okay, sword yeah, up. Yeah, yeah. But then he breaks but then the he sword. Breaks the sword and he that's kills how the warrior. the warrior dies. I knew there was going to be a loophole. Yeah. <laughs> So Luxa and Rip Red are at We're going to try to work this out politically. We're going to like not resort to violence. The Underland kind of returns to like a state of like semi-normalcy. Gregor's mom and dad are like, all right, we're getting out of here permanent. Like this yeah. time. Yeah, yeah. We're moving so far away. <laughs> that they will never be able to reach us. You will never be able to reach us. I think there's something about sealing the entrances. We're not going to let this happen ever again. Yeah. And so Luxa and Gregor are like, but we love each other. Oh my gosh. <laughs> uh, but they can't do anything about it. They're yeah. separated almost immediately. They have one last picnic date. And the book that. ends with Gregor extremely traumatized and depressed, Aww. sitting by himself in a park on a swing set, basically thinking about how his life's never going to be the same. He's never going to see these people again, how he's never going to be able to undo the things he's done. And he's just like in this deep, deep pit of despair. And then Boots walks up and says, Gregor. And Gregor's like, oh, you learned my name. Aww. And that's how it ends. Yeah, because the entire book, she calls him Giggle. And me as a kid reading that, I was like. Yeah, it's actually kind of ends similar to how the Final Hunger Games book yeah. ends. Because mm. it ends with Katniss in a field with her daughter, I think. Mm-hmm. And yeah. just thinking about like, wow. I'm traumatized, huh? At least Katniss yeah. gets with someone. Gregor. <laughs> yeah, Gregor. Oh, gosh. Yeah, like, at least Katniss has, like, another. Well, I guess, like. At yeah, least no, Katniss. Gregor's... At least everyone ha- has context for what Katniss went through to some yeah. degree. Like, we were all a part of this war. Yeah. For Gregor, it's like, well, maybe my sister has a handful of memories of the Underland. I know my slightly older but still younger than me sister has memories of that. And my parents do. And that's about it. Yeah. And the only people who can really reciprocate an understanding of these extremely difficult experiences, including the person that I, in my, you know, hormonal youth have developed feelings for, is locked away from me forever. (sighs) Wow. Well, what is for dinner? (laughs) (laughs) I don't even have a souvenir because I broke it. I broke it to make a political point. That's a lot. That is a lot. But hey, you know what? Uh, To round out... um, All this talk of depression and darkness and trauma and the horrors of war. I do want to bring up something we found earlier, which is in this library book of Gregor the Overlander, the first book. They have this stuff at the end that I don't know if you see a lot in children's books nowadays. Yeah, it's not as common now to have like author Q and A's at the end. Yeah, there's like I mean, you know, sometimes you get an afterword about the author, whatever. But you got this, yeah, this little Q and A with Suzanne Collins just talking about like. Not where it's like, so how did you get into writing? So how did, you know, because everyone has so much professionalism nowadays. It's like, of all the places Gregor could have traveled to, why the Underland? It's also like, who would you want to be your guest at yeah. dinner? Like, are you anything like Gregor? Many people think bats, rats, cockroaches, and spiders are creepy. Did you have to get over your fear to, <laughs> or any fear at all you had of these to write them in the book? And Suzanne Collins just responds like, 
I wish I could say that after I researched the creepy animals, I was no longer at all afraid of them, but that would be a big fib. Cockroaches aren't really scary, just a little germy, so I don't mind them as much. I love bats, except these really loud ones in my attic at summer that hold some kind of party there all night long. <laughs> Spiders still scare me some, although I'm fascinated by them, and I can happily watch them from a distance, but rats... Not pet rats, but the wild kind. I will always have what I consider to be a healthy fear of rats. You should too. And it's just yes. this nice little like, <laughs> hey, so I know we all went through a, a very difficult experience here reading this book, living vicariously through Gregor's life. But it's make-believe still. There's, you know. There's no giant cockroaches. Thank goodness. Yeah. Underneath. Unless. The, no. Unless. No. Um, hey, you want to go to New York, Victoria? No. We can look. That's okay. One of the entrances in Central Park. We just got to keep <laughs> pushing over rocks until we find it. That's true. Let's look up hollow earth theory, huh? <laughs> oh my gosh. Um, but yeah, and then there's a lovely question that I think you found. I'll let, I, I want you to read this one, Victoria. You can read as much as you want, but the one about which character you'd invite to dinner. This one was fun. Um, it says, if you could invite one of the characters to have dinner with your family, who would it be? What might you cook for them? What questions would you ask them? What a fun question. I know. Whoever interviewed Suzanne Collins, good job. Props to you. Susan Collins might have just interviewed herself. It's possible. That's true. Possible. Anyways. Good job. Um, Good job. Suzanne Collins answered, I would invite Rip Red to dinner because I think he would tell the most interesting stories. Excellent choice. We would have to serve shrimp in cream sauce because this is his favorite dish of all. Just to irritate him, I would tell him he had to use a napkin in order to get dessert. He would use the napkin because dessert would be a fabulous chocolate cake and he loves food, but I bet he would glare at me the whole time. I would ask all kinds of questions about being a rat and living alone in the deadland and about his family. Rip Red sometimes sneaks up to the overland, so I would ask him his opinion of New York City, too. After dinner, we'd play Scrabble. And that's all the time we have today. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for listening to Nostalgia Club. Yes. Stay tuned after the credits to hear us try and summarize this series to our boss on the phone oh my gosh it's right seconds yeah um but in the meantime stay safe around the laundry room and goodbye goodbye Bye. thank you for listening to nostalgia club if you enjoyed this episode follow us on twitter and instagram at underscore nostalgia club leave a comment give us a rating and subscribe you can also send us an email with your suggestions for what we should review next at nostalgia club podcast at gmail.com Casey, how's it going? Good, how you doing? Good. Um, I just wanted to tell you about a new possible audio drama idea. Okay. Have you ever heard of Gregor the Underlander? Or the Overlander? <laughs> Gregor the Overlander? <laughs> no, I haven't. Okay, well, let me tell you all about it, okay? All right, I'm ready. Okay, so there's this kid named Gregor who lives um, in New York with his mom and his two younger sisters. And one day um, he gets he goes to the laundry room and his little sister Boots gets pulled in through a grate by uh, uh, like some wind, some magical wind. And they both fall wow. into a place called the Underland where there are giant cockroaches and rats and all sorts of creatures, and there's also some humans who live down there, and they're called the Underlanders because uh, they used to live in the Overland, but now they live underground, and their skin is all pale and stuff. Anyways, uh, Gregor finds out that he's possibly the hero of a quest, so he goes, at first he rejects it, but then he realizes he uh, has no choice, he has no free will, and then he ends up finding his dad, who's been missing for several years, in the Underland. And he rescues his dad. They fight off the rats. And they return back to the Overland uh, to see his mom. And that's it. I don't know if it's going to translate too well. Well, here's the thing. It all happens underground where it's uh, in the dark. So it wouldn't work well as, like, a TV show, but as a podcast. Maybe. Oh, all right, all right. I mean, we do have some subterranean creatures that live in our world, so there might be some conflict there. But I, I don't know. We can, we can, we can talk further. <laughs> okay, sounds good. Uh, we'll discuss our future uh, audio dramas later. <laughs> the prospects from here. I'm yes. all on board. Let okay. <laughs> uh, Suzanne Collins, if you uh, want to ever make an audio drama adaptation, call Whalen Productions. It's Suzanne Collins. It's Hunger Games Lady. Yeah. 
Wow. Mm-hmm. It's pretty good. I recommend it. Okay. All right. All right. I did. Uh, I did enjoy some of the things you did in Hunger Games uh, here and there. It's you know, why not? Yeah. Okay. Well, I'll uh, talk to you later, Casey. All right. Take care, Victoria. <laughs> Bye.